What's up, guys? Welcome back to another daily Bible reading snapshot. Today in the Old Testament, we're looking at 1 Kings 19 and 20. And in the New Testament, we're looking at John chapter 2. So right here we see after Elijah just defeated those prophets of Baal, really, it was the Lord who defeated the prophets of Baal. But after that happens, and God proves himself that he really is the only God, right after that, Elijah runs away, which might seem like the wrong thing to do, but here's what was going on. Jezebel hated Elijah. Jezebel was a super intense worshiper of Baal and Ashtoreth. So when these prophets are defeated, Jezebel seeks after him. And it says that he ran away. Elijah ran away and he's actually fed by the angels at this point. He's fed by angels here in the wilderness, which is interesting. The first thing I want you to notice is there is a miraculous feeding. Okay, What other time in the Bible was there a miraculous feeding in the wilderness? Well, you might know, well, with the manna in, in the book of Numbers, especially uh, in the book of Exodus. Yeah, the wilderness people, they had some special feeding. Okay, keep reading. It says that he went to this place um, called Mount Horeb, which is the Mount of God. Mount Horeb is another name for Mount Sinai. You see the connection we're making here? That Elijah was miraculously sustained by food in the wilderness. That his journey took 40 days. That's interesting. Miraculously fed, 40 days to Mount Sinai. I think you're getting the theme here that's going on. Um, there's something that's going to happen that's really important. It says that God spoke to Elijah in a low voice, in this low whisper. Interesting that there's an earthquake and there's um, crazy wind. There's fire. There's all this stuff that happens at Mount Sinai, a lot like when God last visited Mount Sinai with Moses. We see here next, it says that that Elijah's there, and what he says is, because the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, okay? the promise that God made. They have left it behind. Now, why do you think Elijah goes to Mount Sinai to say to God, they have rejected your covenant? I think there's an important thing that's happening here. I think Elijah is asking God to reaffirm this covenant, and he really is complaining about how the people are not obeying it. And what God says is, I know they have been disobedient, but I have kept 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal, and they are going to worship and serve me, which I think is a good pattern that we see in the scriptures, which this text, 1 Kings 19, should make us reference back Moses and the wilderness wanderings and all that stuff. But what we see here is there might be a lot of people who don't obey God, but in every generation, God is keeping some people who are obeying him well. Even in this evil generation where Jezebel was having her sin run rampant and Ahab, her husband, was terrible, there were 7,000 men who hadn't bowed the knee to these false gods. And that includes this guy that we see named Elisha. Elisha is the man who's going to replace Elijah as the prophet when Elijah's dead and gone, which that's a Bible joke for you if you caught that. Um, but anyway... We're going to see some things here in chapter 20 as well. That um, Ahab, the attention goes back to Ahab, the king in the north. He's fighting against the king of Syria. Ben-Hadad is his name. And Ben-Hadad is a guy that we're going to see a lot because he is a big problem for the Israelites in the north because his kingdom is just to the north of them. And they are constantly coming down and being the superpower and oppressing these people in the south. And it says that Ahab actually ends up defeating them says that for a while here, um, it didn't look like that was going to be the case. The king of Syria threatens Ahab in the south, to the south of him. He's the north in Israel. But it says after this, um, Elijah actually tells Ahab, which you might think that's the good guy and the bad guy. Why is Elijah talking to Ahab? Well, the reason I think comes in verse 28. A man of God came near and said to the king of Israel, um, Thus says the Lord, because the Syrians have said, this is what the Syrians believed about God, the Lord is a God of the hills, but he is not a God of the valleys. God says, therefore, I will give all this multitude into your hand. So a hundred thousand Syrians or Arameans, that's the other name for them, Sirius, Syria, Aram, same place. A um, hundred thousand of them fall this day. And it's crazy. It's crazy how this all works because they couldn't do it on their own. God made this happen. But the problem is God commanded Ahab through this prophet, hey, you need to kill Ben-Hadad because he's a really bad guy and he's going to cause a lot of problems. So you need to kill him. Instead of killing him, 
Ahab devises this plan to say, you know what? I can make this good treaty with him once I get him in a place of vulnerability. So let's just do that instead. So he lets Ben-Hadad go. And what this prophet says is, because you, Ahab, did not follow God, your life is going to be given out. You're going to have your blood be spilled um, in a terrible way. So that's the end of 1 Kings 20. And we're going to see how that makes Ahab sad. And we're going to see what he does in chapter 21, which is not good because of that sadness. So Again, we're seeing that God is in control. We're seeing that God has his people in his nation and in his um, in His kingdom here that are not bowing the knee to these evil powers. And the same thing's true today. God has his people that are not um, giving in to the temptations that everybody else are giving into. So uh, that's our Old Testament reading. Here in the New Testament, John chapter 2, interesting chapter. It is the first chapter in the book of John where we see a miracle from Jesus. I want you to think, what is a miracle and why does Jesus do miracles? In this chapter, they're called signs. And Jesus will refer to them a couple times as signs. What are they? Why does Jesus do them? Well, I think the first reason Jesus does signs is to prove that he really is God. And when you think about what a sign is, just remember, signs point to things. What do these signs point to? First thing is that Jesus really is God. That he really has all the authority of God. That he really speaks with God's authority. But the second thing is, it's meant to teach us something as well. And we see in this one, when he turns water into wine, what we see is he is the creator. Just like in the beginning, when God created just by the word of his mouth, Jesus has that same power to create. And there's an interesting line here at the end where the, the wedding guests said um, that the, the new wine is better than the old wine. And what is that talking about? Well, it's interesting that even this new creation that Jesus gives is even better than the old creation. I think that points to a really big reality that when Jesus remakes this world and when he remakes people, right, it's even better than before. Jesus creates something even better than what was in the beginning which is a really cool thing that we see about Jesus. And we learn about Jesus from this parable, not the parable, this uh, miracle. So that's at the beginning of this chapter. Then we see Jesus going into the temple saying, I don't like what's going on here because it's his temple. It belongs to him. He's the one who should be receiving the worship, um, but they are doing terrible things in it. They're being greedy and all this stuff. So then it says at the end of the chapter that Jesus would not entrust himself to other people. He wouldn't share his entire heart about everything to everyone else. He wouldn't trust other people in that way. He didn't believe or entrust himself to people. Why? Because he knows what's inside of them. He's the only one that does. Everybody else, they're always guessing at what's going on inside people's hearts. Jesus knows. And I think the big thing here is we see that everything belongs to Jesus. He is the Lord of all the earth. We see that he has dominion over all of creation. He can make new creation. He can do whatever he wants with that. He also is in control of the temple. That belongs to him. And even more than that, he's over everyone's hearts. He knows everything that's going on with everybody. Um, and that should really just make our view of Jesus be elevated. That he's not just some person that talks on God's behalf. He is all the power of God in and of himself. So super important for us to recognize about Jesus. And hopefully that should humble us before Jesus as we recognize how good he truly is. So thanks for reading the Bible with us. Make sure you read it all today. I know that was a lot on 1 Kings 19 20 and John chapter 2. But if you read the whole thing, you will be blessed in your reading because God will show you awesome things as you trust him as you continue to read. So we'll see you back tomorrow for another daily Bible reading snapshot.